welcome to People in Power. I'm Barbara Serra. On today's program, return to Rwanda. In April 1994, the world watched in horror as the tiny Central African state of Rwanda tore itself apart. Long-standing tensions between Hutus and Tutsis, the two main ethnic groups, exploded when the plane of the Hutu president, Juvenal Habyarimana, was shot down. Exactly who killed the president has never been established, but the effect was instantaneous. An unofficial Hutu militia called the Interahamwe went on a genocidal rampage, as did thousands of ordinary Hutus in a spasm of ethnic hatred brought to a fever pitch by years of anti-Tutsi propaganda. The resulting bloodbath saw more than 800,000 Tutsis massacred and sparked the return of the exiled Rwandan Patriotic Front, which then captured the capital, Kigali. Fearing reprisals, as many as two million Hutus then fled across the border to what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Well, now, 16 years on, many of those same Hutus want to go back home as part of a reconciliation and repatriation program sponsored by the UN and the Rwandan government. But what sort of welcome awaits them? Suryo Samura has been to find out. What is it like to be branded as killers? These people know. We're in a United Nations refugee transit camp in Goma, in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. They are all Rwandan Hutus who fled in 1994 following the victory of the invading Tutsi-led rebel force, the RPF. They were joined by the Hutu power extremists who were responsible for the Rwandan genocide earlier that year, in which an estimated 800,000 people, mostly Tutsis, were killed. Tomorrow, after more than 15 years, these people are going home. And I'm here to join one of them and experience with them the journey they are about to make to understand what it's like for these people to return to Rwanda after those fateful few months of 1994. These people have been living in exile side by side with the very people who are responsible for the genocide, the Interahamwe, who are still out there fighting and are still a threat to the Rwandan government. For 15 years, many of these people have been living in terrible conditions in the forest of the Congo, constantly moving. So why now, after all these years, are they deciding to go, to return to Rwanda? Ugo none tukaba twatohoje batubwira ko mu Rwanda rutari kwica ko ruri kwakira wari we wese tukaba twahisemo kugira ute gutaha twari twagiye mu mashamba tuba mu giturage twaje gutaha basirikari bafudirere bakaga bo bavanye mu dite mu gutaha many of the people in the camp seemed frightened and suspicious I was getting concerned that no one would want to share their journey with us. Then we met Vestine. She was 16 when she fled with her family over 15 years ago. Many, including her father, died in the ordeal, and she hasn't seen any of them since the summer of 1997. <laughs> Vestin went on to become the man's wife, but after all of her five children were born by caesarean section, her husband asked her to leave. After telling us her moving story, 
Westerners agree that we can accompany her. For me, it's tough because most of the refugees I've seen here today or this evening are really, really young. And most of them, some of them have told me that they were about 8, 10, 12, 14 when the genocide happened. Of course, it's possible that um, some of their parents, loved ones, family members or family friends may have been involved in the genocide. But, you know, for some of them, they knew nothing. They were only children. The arrival of around 2 million Rwandan refugees into the Congo in 1994, here on the shores of Lake Kivu, together with the Hutu militia, now known as the FDLR, has led to a bitter period of conflict in which an estimated 5.4 million people, mostly civilians, have lost their lives. Vite naanza ku Congo na depuis 94 ça va le fika huko. Ndio ima ima village yetu mapori na kwa ma security watu waikale bien. Kisha kuongea sasa ndio sasa hapo ba refugee ba huko na ba toto bote ba fa nini? Baanza kutoka leo hapa. Kisha kufika kule bote biko ba genocide. Est-ce que batarudia? Back at the transit camp, the refugees were getting ready for the journey ahead. There are estimated to be around 35,000 Rwandan refugees that remain in the Democratic Republic of Congo, along with around 5,000 armed combatants of the FDLR. Last year, a new alliance formed between the Congolese and Rwandan governments, along with the United Nations, has resulted in two major military operations against the Hutu rebels. Although they haven't been entirely successful, it has resulted in an influx of refugees asking the United Nations Refugee Agency to help them go home. Then in November last year, two of the FDLR High Command were arrested in Germany bringing new hope that the militia may finally be coming to its end. It was interesting to see how happy and excited people seemed. I expected there to be more fear about what awaited them back home, but clearly they were just happy to be leaving behind such a difficult time in their lives. About 20 kilometers across the border, we arrived in another transit camp run jointly by the UN and Rwanda's own National Commission for Refugees. Although it wasn't yet home, this was still the first time these people had set foot on Rwandan soil in over 15 years. <laughs> We were told Vestin would have to wait four days before the transport left for her region. The day before her departure, we returned to the camp to see how she was getting on. I found her sitting with the few that remained and had a chance to talk to one of them about their experiences in the Congo. Abandi 
The more I heard about the horrific conditions these people had been living in, the more I understood why they were so happy to be back. But Vestine seemed quiet, and I thought she might be anxious about the trip tomorrow. <laughs> I couldn't help but feel anxious for Vestine. She doesn't know the whereabouts of any of her family, and she's going back alone with her children after more than 15 years, hoping to reclaim her father's land. Rwanda is the most densely populated country in Africa, with over 10 million people living in one of the continent's smallest countries. The competition for land was an important factor in fueling the conflict that led to the genocide. And with thousands of refugees still returning every year, it continues to be a problematic and potentially explosive issue. Vestine might find herself in conflict with people who may now be on her family's property. We were just approaching the village when Vestine asked us to stop the car. It seemed that she had already recognized someone. The woman was Vestine's cousin. It was a relief to see that Vestine still had family here. We heard that her stepbrother was here too, but we hadn't yet heard anything about her father's land. Mm. The lady was an old neighbor, and it was good to see Vestine getting such a warm welcome. Despite her long absence, she seemed to know where she was going. So, Vestine, how would you have carried this with all the children? Really? She told us this was all her father's land and we were obviously getting near the house. It was clear that someone was living in the house, and Vestine seemed to realize that it yeah. wasn't her family. Vestine, you okay? We'd clearly generated a lot of interest in the village, but we hadn't seen any more of Vestine's family members. Then, as we were waiting, the woman who was living in the house turned up. So that's the... Do you know her? Vestine. Do you want to talk to her?
back in her old house seemed to bring back a lot of memories of Estine. I asked the village chief to explain what was happening to the lady of the house, then thought it would be best to give them all some space. We will come and see you tomorrow, okay? Good luck. <laughs> Good luck, Mama. So, Chief, now that Vestine has returned, how do you think the village is going to receive her? What are you going to do to help her to settle down? Kandi, bari ya mwana hari ya, bari ni miti yangu ye. Nuko nuko mchiri hano bara mshaka chane, bara mukumbi muri mche. Bari tarero ba msura, bari bicha chini ye, bara chimu fasha na bubu unga ni raku kuvio kwa mhaye. Nyuma kwa inatuko huu yobozi. Land is a serious issue in, 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 in Africa. I mean, she's back. It looks like someone is using the land that she was hoping to come and use. What's going to happen? It's hard to imagine that the last time Vestin was here, up to a million people were lying dead all over this country. Most of them murdered by their very own neighbors. I wanted to understand what actually happened here in this village, all those years ago when Vestin and her family first decided to flee. Chief, how are you doing, sir? Chief, can you tell me what happened in this village during the genocide of 1994? In a village of 2,000 people, the chief told us that 205 Tutsis were killed leaving 45 survivors who continue to live here with their children. As for the killers, the majority of them continue to live here too, as part of the same community. The National Unity and Reconciliation Commission has been at the heart of the country's effort to overcome the legacy of the genocide. It has embraced a policy of community building through dialogue and has turned to a number of traditional practices to facilitate this approach. One such practice is the return of community mediators like the chief, or Abunzi, as it was traditionally known. His role is to oversee local disputes and to try and resolve problems within the community, promoting dialogue and community participation. I have to admit, I found it almost unbelievable how these communities are continuing to live together. I asked the chief if he would take me to see someone who had participated in the genocide. Anyway. I wanted to ask him what it was that drove him to kill his own neighbors. He <laughs> Like most of the genocide perpetrators in this village, this man confessed to his crimes, thereby receiving a reduced sentence. I asked him if he found it difficult living together now with the survivors. Nothing 
The whole situation is truly remarkable, but this was obviously only one side of the story. I wanted to hear from the survivors how it felt to be living side by side with the very people who had killed their families. One such survivor is Serafim. She was 10 years old when the killing began, and out of a family of 12, she lost all but one brother. Most of those responsible for the deaths confessed to their crimes and have since returned to the village. She now lives here alone with her child after her husband recently died of an illness. <laughs> Sarafin has just recently received compensation from her attackers as ordered by one of the local gachacha courts, the traditional community-based tribunals that were set up by the government to deal with the overwhelming backlog of genocide cases. <laughs> Sarafin, have you really forgiven these people? Do you honestly believe that real forgiveness will take place in this country? Sarafin was an incredibly courageous young lady, but speaking to her, I could feel how close to the surface those memories still were. And it made me realize that despite the astounding sense of progress, the situation here is still very delicate. Hearing about everything that had happened here in this village made me think of Vestine as a 16-year-old girl caught in the middle of this madness that would totally change the course of her life. I went to pay her a final visit and found her looking the happiest I'd seen her and reunited with her two remaining brothers. And although she would have to wait a year before getting her father's property back, her journey had ended well. When we started this journey in the Congo, we had no idea how it was going to end. But this time, it's good news from Africa. Good news from a country that has come a long way from a terrible past. Well, that's it for this edition of People in Power. If you'd like to comment on today's film, then we'd love to hear from you. Do get in touch on aljazeera.net forward slash English. Until next time, goodbye.